Welcome back to another episode of World Beyond Belief. We have an incredible guest today, Eric Kallstrom. Uh, I heard an interview on Red Ice Radio with him, and I was so impressed. But I wasn't nearly as impressed as I was when I went to his website. He's an incredible researcher. He has a broad uh, look at a couple subjects that are really important right now. The New Age Deception and how that works in with the green agenda that's coming to a head right now, or they're trying to bring to a head. So let's welcome to the World Beyond Belief, Eric Karlstrom. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be talking to you from Colorado to Ecuador via the modern uh, magic of, of Skype and computers. Right. And <laughs> when we're older people and we're kind of ludates, so we piece this together the best we can. So, uh, yes. why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Eric, and tell us how you got in, interested in doing this kind of research, because this is a little off of your major topic, isn't it? Okay, well, I, uh, yeah, I've, I've just retired from a 30-year career as a physical geography professor, uh, if physical geography is different from cultural geography. Physical geography is the kind of the nature or land or earth side of the equation, humans and the earth. Uh, the cultural geography would look more at, at the human component. Uh, the physical geography would include climatology, geomorphology, which is landforms, soils, and biogeography and particularly the distribution of these uh, various uh, uh, processes and systems. And uh, so, you know, my master's was in Laramie, Wyoming, uh, looking at uh, uh, soils and landforms, especially uh, alluvial deposits associated with an archaeological site in the Bighorn Mountains that went back about seven or eight or 9,000 years. Then my PhD in uh, Montana, Alberta, was on the glacial history of Glacier National Park. I find I've found beautiful places to work. Yeah. And uh, um, what I found there, Paul, was uh, on the older glacial deposits preserved in remnants on ridges, I found thick red, well-developed soils that looked like they might come from North Carolina or Virginia. Well, uh, in s soils form as a result of several uh, environmental processes, actually five, and the most important of which is climate. So uh, I looked carefully at the soils and deduced that they formed under a warmer, wetter climate significantly. And these things are maybe one million to two million years old, so they are in the present ice age, which is the last two to three million years, uh, forming during the interglacial periods. We are in an interglacial period right now, the last 10,000 years. And we have had the benefit of a, a benign climate, uh, which has allowed agriculture to develop and humans to flourish. And of course, our population has, has skyrocketed in the last 10,000 years, you know, the, yeah. old, the old J curve, population J curve. Well, part of that is because of the age of agriculture. Part of that, of course, is because of fossil fuel energy. And both of these become important factors here because around 1850, of course, uh, we started using... Uh, coal, gas, and oil, uh, fossil fuels uh, in our industrial revolution, and, uh, and we vastly increased the, the uh, power uh, uh, capability to the everyday person. And uh, so, and of course, uh, a byproduct of the burning of any fossil fuel, which is carbon-based, is going to be carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is a trace gas, about four molecules in 10,000 um, are, uh, are carbon dioxide. So it's only 360 parts per million. And actually, as we all learned in our eighth grade biology class, CO2 is absolutely essential for photosynthesis for plants. So it's a, it's, it, it, yes, it gives us a little bit of a kick with the greenhouse effect. It holds a little bit of extra heat in the atmosphere. Water vapor is much more important, especially in your neck of the woods in, in Ecuador. But, um, but anyway, carbon dioxide now has been, you know, we're told a series of preposterous lies, I think, to help make us 
uh, dumb and and vulnerable. And of course, Hitler Hitler said, you know, oh, the bigger the lie and the more you repeat it, the more people will believe it. So this lie has been going on all my career. But l let me just let me just uh, go back a little bit. I, I've taught at three universities: Northern Arizona University for five years, University of Kansas for a year as a visiting professor, and then the last 22 years of my career were at. Uh, California State University Stanislaus in the Central Valley. Now when I got to Stan State, or sometimes we call it Turkey Tech, because that's where the turkey races were held at the fairgrounds of an agricultural biz, agribusiness area in the Central Valley. Um, when I got there, uh, I was offered to teach a course called Human Ecology. Well, Human Ecology is uh, was not on the radar prior to that time, but all over the country at that time, about 1990, university geography departments and anthropology departments were starting to offer this new course. And this becomes interesting because the uh, Institute of Human Ecology was a CIA front for a lot of mind control, of course. as you probably know, of back course. in the 50s. Well, this is a different kind of mind control because human ecology was uh, you know, an upper division liberal arts course that a lot of students took, you know, people who were going to be teachers and whatnot. And uh, basically, I, I was looking around for, you know, props to teach this new course. By the way, in 1990, we started capitalizing the, the word Earth. <laughs> Back in the 80s, the Earth didn't have a capital E. In 1990, all of a sudden, you know, with the Gaia hypothesis and everything, yeah. universities became part of the propaganda system. Sure. And professors like me were very much part of it. So for the first 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, I taught this human ecology. I had about 100 students in, in my sections. And uh, I enjoyed it because I, I love nature and I've always considered myself an environmentalist. Uh, I've climbed and I've hiked and I've skied and I've been a boatman. I've done all kinds of things. I love nature. That's why I'm in Colorado at Crestone here under the four 14,000 foot peaks. Uh, but but uh, basically, uh, for the first 10 years, I taught the course basically out of a biology text called Environment. And it was basically a litany of environmental issues and problems. And, uh, you know, overpopulation and global warming and soil erosion and, you know, loss of biodiversity and all this stuff, which I later found out was, you know, mostly bogus. Right. And, uh, and, right. Yeah, <laughs> really, it really is bogus. Right. And but, they're pushing and, they, and at this point they were pushing it into the college curriculums. It was absolute. Oh, man. Well, OK, so at that time. 1990, I'm looking around for props. I'm teaching new courses. And uh, we had a kind of a, a lady there who was uh, in charge of, you know, special supplementary materials. She just happened to have gotten in a 10 part video series. We used VHS back in those days called Race to Save the Planet. Oh, geez. Race to Save the Planet was a 10 part series, each which reinforced all of these, you know, global environmental issues. It was introduced by Marie Strong. Oh. And it was then narrated by Roy Scheider, and each episode is was uh, introduced by Meryl Streep. So you had these, you know, I mean, and that took you all over the world looking at, you know, environmental issues. And I thought at the time that it was great because, you know, it, it, it was an hour. It got the students looking <laughs> at global issues, which I thought was good at that time. And, uh, it, you know, it, it allowed me to kind of kick back a little bit. And then, you know, lecture afterwards. But um, anyway, so that was my introduction to Murray Strong. He was the super uh, environmental potentate at the United Nations that, uh, you know, started uh, all of these different environmental programs like UNESCO and things like that and highly connected. OK, so I teach for 10 years and then about the year 2000, at the end of, the, of, of one of my classes, at the just before Christmas break, a, a young man got up and he kind of huffed off and he said, "Ah, junk science," <laughs> and uh, and I, you know, I was kind of offended, you know, but but even then, for the first ten years, I did not teach that you know humans were causing catastrophic global warming because I knew all about climate cycles because of my own research right. and that of my father. My father was a U.S. Geological Survey geologist who mapped the glacial history of Alaska while I was a child, right. and he came up in the 50s 
correlating with the cycles, natural climate cycles, that were in the geologic record, in the deep sea cores, in the glacial record, and in all kinds of other kinds of proxy records. And, you know, I have to hand it to my father, who just recently passed, that, you know, he was, he was a workaholic and he was close to a genius. And I think he was right. Uh, in fact, in 1977, when I was getting my PhD, there were a couple seminal papers uh, that came out in 76 and 77. Uh, that proved that the Milankovitch or astronomic theory of climate change being cyclical based on variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun was, was, was validated by dating of sediments in the deep sea cores, in the Czechoslovakian LUS and soil sequence, in the Chinese LUS and soil sequence, which had all been dated. And uh, this was in 77. So the people who are pushing this global warming uh, propaganda, hoax, fraud, whatever, have had to ignore an enormous amount of, of real scientific data. They've had to sweep away the real experts and put in clowns like Al Gore, you know, who got, uh, I think, a C and a D or a D and an F, and the only two courses he had, you know, that were roughly related right. to environment, you know. So, you know, and of course, we're all supposed to believe Al Gore based on his authority, you know, he was... Like, like we're now supposed to believe the Pope because he's an yeah. authority figure or the Dalai Lama because he's an authority figure. So this is, you know, this is a technique that's been used through the ages. You know, yeah. you appeal to authority. Well, that's not science. Uh, science sweeps away authority with data and right. information. And uh, so all of the data, and I, let me just mention I have four websites. And the yes. one I think you're referring to, yeah. And, and of course, it was Marie Strong who wrote the Terms of Reference for all the United Nations supported research into climate change. And if you look at the terms of reference for all of this research, it says right in the paragraph that we define climate change as climate change is caused by humans. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're gonna forget about nature now. We live in right. nature, you know, we have we have day and night, we right. have the seasons. You know, we have winter and summer, and maybe in Ecuador it's not very pronounced, but here in in, in Colorado it's certainly pronounced. You yes, know? it is. So we have we have yearly cycles. We have sunspot cycles of you know eleven, twenty two, ninety years, etc. We have these astronomic cycles based on variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun. My dad's contribution, I think, was he proved the tidal cycles, where you had variations in the gravitational relations between the the Earth and the Moon with giving you uh, 139, 256, 550, and 1100 year cycles, which are resonances of each other. We, we live in a harmonic system of, of, you know, Earth, Sun, Moon, planets, each of which has a uh, electromagnetic field. A gravity. We, we live in the atmosphere of the Sun, and the Sun uh, it, of course, has an enormous amount of radiation that it throws our way. A lot of it is electromagnetic. We can't, we can't see most of it. And there are storms, etc. So, and then we're just getting to understand a little bit better about how the sun works and how it has varied in its intensity over time. So the sun, of course, drives our climate system. Uh, CO2 is a tiny, 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 tiny bit player, perhaps totally insignificant. But if, if the United Nations and Marie Strong with the United Nations wants to control all economic activity, they need to sell us on this proposition that right. this tiny trace gas of CO2, which is a product of burning fossil fuel, right. is destroying the environment. Well, 85% of the world's energy right now, anyway, comes from burning of fossil fuel. So if you can convince people that we're destroying the earth by driving our cars or, you know, having a steel plant, then, uh, of course, then they can tax that activity. They can tax, you know, running your lawnmower, every activity. Right. Versus, you know, running your toaster. Electricity, of course, comes from mostly coal and gas. Uh, uh, and so uh, this is a, this is a, a ploy uh, for the elite to control economic activity in the world and to basically take money from the industrialized countries and give it to the uh, developing quote unquote or less developed countries and to reduce us all to poverty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they would do that, of course, while they strip away our Bill of Rights rights, you know. Right. It also puts them in control of everything. 
because yeah. human human beings create CO2. Right, and of course, my my take on this, and this is off of my uh, uh, naturalclimatechange.us website. My take on this is global warming, of course, fulfills many functions. You know, it was it was the idea came up in the report from Iron Mountain back in the early '60s as as a substitute for war. You know, we can use things like a space program and fear of global warming to destroy a lot of excess wealth so that the poor don't, don't get, right. get enough money to start thinking, you know, That's because right. poor people are just as smart as rich people. And if you have if they have access to to knowledge and information and creativity, they they're going to run with it. And uh, so this has always been the oligarchical strategy to keep the poor down. But anyway, so yeah, the the uh, report from Iron Mountain mentions uh, perhaps we could use global warming as a you know substitute for war, and then of course the Club of Rome in their book you know the first revolution back in 1990 and even previously they they taken this up as a, as a modern version of the eugenics program. We have to kill off 90 percent of humanity, and we have to find a reason to do that. Right. This is the elite. This is the Rockefeller eugenics Nazi. Uh, Gates. You know, which, which right. yeah, eugenics. So the modern environmental movement then becomes uh, uh, the modern version of the old eugenics program. Right. And it, of course, it took me a long time to see that. But it based, so basically, when this, and I, I don't know if you've got this part of the story, but in 2000, I had a student at the end of my human ecology class who stood up and said, uh, This is junk science. There's a lot of Christians in the Central Valley of California. And Christians are the only ones who've given a good critique. And uh, so anyway, of course, uh, I, I was a little bit indignant, but then I started reading the right wing critique of the environmental movement, and in which called it junk science, which it is. 90% um, of it is junk science dressed up with a little bit of expertise by this biologist here who, you know, studied insects in the Amazon. Right. Or or that computer scientist over there who's got a model that says the Earth's going to warm, uh, you know, X number of degrees by the year 2100. All of those predictions are wrong, by the way. Every one of them has, has been disproven because in computers, garbage in, garbage out. Right. The conclusions cannot be any better than the assumptions that go in. And all of these expensive models that use Cray computers you know, from the GRU in London and from Boulder at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research, all of these supercomputers who are trying to do a, a modeling of the Earth's climate system, they all start with the assumption that prior to 1850, when we started burning fossil fuels, that climate was stable. And then humans came along and burned fossil fuels, and then whatever change is due to human activity. Well, that, that's preposterous. In fact, uh, 20,000 years ago, we know Canada was covered with a couple miles of an ice sheet. And right here in Colorado, we had glaciers coming down close to my house 20,000 years ago as the, uh, during the last glacial interval. And, uh, and then we know we've had radical climate swings, glacial, interglacial cycles, about 20 of them in the last two million years big cycles where sea level is popping up and down three four hundred feet on average Whoa. and so you know anybody who is studying the most recent <sighs> geologic period which is the quaternary and I would be a quaternarist who studies the quaternary period anybody who studies that knows about these gigantic natural climate cycles and they all know we all know that uh, about a thousand years ago we had the Viking warm period when my ancestors, Leif Erikson and, and uh, Eric the Red, were able to sail off, you know, and discover Greenland and Iceland and North America because there was much less, it was warmer in the northern Atlantic. Right. It was less pack ice. And that's when the Vikings came down and, and just did a world tour and conquered all kinds of countries. They had their moment, you know, in history. Yeah. We had our moment, the yeah. Vikings. And uh, this was a natural warming period between about 800 and 1200 AD. Um, uh, you know, it was significantly warmer in Europe. And by the way, here's the big news. When it's warm, the growing seasons are longer. Right. 
agriculture is better. People get wealthier. That's when they built the cathedrals. There was a lot of wealth at that time because it's warm. The average temperature of the earth is 59 degrees Fahrenheit yeah. now. I, and what do we like? We like 70. So there's 11 degrees that we can, you know, <laughs> we can move right. towards. Well, and those people retire. They those, go to warm places. Right, exactly. And those periods were high periods of CO2, right? Well, in the geologic past, I, I think a, a thousand years ago, probably very little difference. But you're right. There's when there's more vegetation, and there's more plants in general. Even though plants give off oxygen, in general, there's a little more CO2. But we, if we look back at the at the distant geologic record, we see periods when CO2 uh, didn't just double; it it increased four or five, six times, and it can increase four or five, six times with no deleterious effects on 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 life so we've been fed um, preposterous lies and and it's so sad because you know people who apply for jobs at universities now uh, you know call themselves climate scientists well the, what they are is they're computer scientists they, they might know nothing uh -huh. about the climate I've done a series of interviews with uh, dr. Tim Ball it's uh -huh. on my website and he was the first PhD in climatology in Canada, uh, out of University of London, I believe, and uh, taught at University of Winnipeg, and we've had about eight or ten conversations on this, and he's all over this as well, uh, and has been a voice in the wilderness, so to speak, for a long time. I would recommend listening to Tim Ball when you can, okay. and, and my interviews with him are very instructive, but uh, yeah, so... You know, natural climate change is very important, and, and they factored that out of the assumptions of these enormous computer models uh, where they're actually trying to simulate reality. Well, anybody who knows how complex reality is knows that we're only going to ever approximate because there's, there's thousands of variables. But what they like to do is reduce it to two variables, <laughs> X and a Y axis, uh -huh. and uh, you've got uh, CO2 on one axis, axis on the bottom axis, and then temperature yeah. on the top ax, uh, axis and uh, so the other assumption is that co2 carbon dioxide is the main climate driver well that's preposterous again <laughs> it's 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 probably number a hundred <laughs> <laughs> if, if that you know I mean for certainly the Sun ocean circulation atmospheric circulation variations in the Earth's orbit around the Sun variations in the moon's orbit around the Earth, there, there, there are a host of other factors, uh, and even water vapor, much, much more important if you want to look at the greenhouse effect right. than CO2. And of course, down in your neck of the woods, water vapor would be a, uh, a big factor because you're not too far from the rainforest, et cetera, right. where there's lots of, lots of vegetation. And that does tend to keep the climate equable, you know, keep the nights warm, yeah. uh, and, and take, the, take the tops, the highest, uh, the extremes remove the extremes just like when you're near the ocean you have a more maritime or moderate climate and when you're in the middle of the continent like here in Colorado you have a more extreme climate so the 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 very premises uh, are are non-scientific it's it's a political agenda uh, cooked up by the UN the UN has then gotten all these nations to sign on uh, to this uh, uh, climate research because you know they get money from federal governments so well over a hundred billion dollars has been spent to prove this preposterous idea uh, and the only way they can do that of course is to select the data that reinforces the the desired conclusion and to ignore the rest of earth science right <laughs> which you've got a you got you know over a hundred years or 200 years 300 years of geologists and earth scientists trying to understand uh, the past, and you have to throw that out the window. You have to just ignore it. And of course, one of the reasons that this is possible is that most humans don't think uh, right. perhaps more than 100 years. Most humans have a hard time thinking 20,000 years ago, 2 million years ago, 20 million, 200 million, 2 billion, 4.5 billion. And Earth scientists, can, like myself, can kind of do that, because we have things to hang on the the timeline. We, we kind of know what happened when. You know, this species right. came in about this time. This species went extinct about this time. These rocks correspond with this period. So the geologic uh, timetable then becomes r real. 
to somebody who spends their life with it. And uh, But the average person does not. And it's not that the average person is not smart, but they have no experience with this kind of thinking. So I can talk to a lawyer till I'm blue in the face on this. And he's listened to NBR, NPR, and yeah. he's a smart guy, uh, but he has no concept of Earth history. <laughs> So well, that's where we are. Right. Well, it's well, he, a very clever ploy. It's a clever ploy. It is. Because if you can get people to be afraid of climate change, because obviously it's not warming, it's been cooling since 1998. <laughs> now, right. they're saying, now they're saying, uh, let's be afraid of climate change. It's like being afraid that the sun's coming up and going down <laughs> right. in, our, in, our, in, our, in our view, you know, or that we have seasons. I mean, this is the way the world is. You know? Right. I, what, when you uh, first got that video that had Meryl Streep in it, mm -hmm. and you were doing the follow along, you must yes. have just. I, it's funny how teachers, when you're told to teach something like that, you you go along with it, and then all of a sudden this guy jarred you out of your comfort zone, and it's wonderful how you, rather than just being gruffly, uh, you know, upset by it and stomping around, you actually did. What the awakening public should do, which is sit down and research it and see what's going on, and and it came to really, in your case, a really good outcome, because now we have a really good crusader for actual science as opposed to the junk science. Well, thank you. I I don't know if you can see my bookshelf here, but the one up there with the station in license uh, plate uh, poster there, that shelf is all books that poo-poo the man-caused global warming uh, hypothesis that disprove it. And my website also disproves it. I have a website or an article there called uh, uh, An Open Letter to Policymakers, Students, and etc. It's about 80 or 90 pages in which I kind of summarize some of the high points from these books and, and my own career. I've given talks at the Geological Society of America on this, but you, you're running against the current because yeah. all the money and the prestige and the power is on the other side. And these grad students come along, you know, from MIT, and, uh, and they are just sold on the idea that their computer models, which I would regard as virtual reality, right. that their computer models are reality. And they, they have become convinced that, you know, as they look at their computer screens, see, old guys like me, we walked out in the field, we got our, got our right. hands and our feet dirty. <laughs> You know, we, we, we actually touched the fossils and the soils and the and the pollen samples and the ostracods and all kinds of, you know, uh, actual data. These guys are all doing uh, modeling based on inputting data from somewhere else. So they never have to go out into the field, That's which, right. which uh, makes it kind of scary to me. Right. <laughs> it's important <laughs> if you're a geologist that you walk on the earth and actually look at it and as much as you can. Actually, when, in doing the research for the podcast I did last week, I run into people with degrees in man-made global warming. Absolutely. Well, when I was, okay, when I, when I made my shift, I guess it was around the year 2000, teaching my, not only my human ecology class, but also my climatology class, I spent a lot of effort disproving it, you know, because you had right. to, because these kids had been propagandized ever since the first grade. Right. This is how they do it now. You know, they get the same material every year uh, from the first grade on. So when I told them this, it, they looked like I'd hit them with a big wet fish. <laughs> right. <laughs> there, was, there was no, it was just shock. But then after a while, it started to sink in. And pretty soon I had a cadre of students that were helping me Ooh. disprove it. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the older students, you know, he would do a report on, you know, the Chicago Climate Exchange and how Al Gore and Marie Strong stood to make billions of dollars and their buddies, the Rothschilds, uh, you know, uh, kind of manipulating the system. Well, and then uh, one student came in and did a report about how the Chicago Climate Exchange closed down in 2009 because they weren't getting the traction they needed. Well, so I had a whole bunch of students. Uh, who did get it, and uh, but then there were all the others and the other professors who, who of course, were pulled into the propaganda system. And I remember the the, the spring that I, the, my last spring there, the biology department had a brown bag 
a seminar series on a Friday afternoon on climate change. They never even informed me, the guy who taught <laughs> climatology, the guy that knew the subject. It would be like geography department people having a seminar on genetics. You know, I mean, right. I got no business talking about genetics. <laughs> but but see, they think they do because they can get money if they throw the right. word climate change into a grant proposal. And one of my students pointed out that the president of our university was part of a group of 700 college professors that had signed up to promote research in climate change. 700 university professors. And I would wager that nary a one has a background in climate science. So again, money will flow if the people make the right moves and college presidents are smart enough to know how to follow the money. Right. So this is, so, uh, you know, my last several years, I was swimming up against the, the current and my human ecology numbers mysteriously dropped off from about 100 per semester to about 20. Somebody in the administration realized that I wasn't feeding the right propaganda to the right. students. So all of a sudden, behind the scenes machinations, my numbers went down. And I could never pinpoint who did that. So this is the kind of bureaucracy uh, type systems that we live in now. Um, and uh, we're, you know, but, yeah, I listen a lot to other people. I don't know if you've heard of Tex Mars. He's oh, yeah, a, we know a, Tex Mars. I, I love his stuff. I yeah. listen to him once a week. And I, I've got many of his books on the New Age, for instance. And uh, he's one of the real experts on the New Age. And he knows that this is nonsense. He has a, he has a, a large following. And he maintains that most Americans don't believe it. And I think that that's probably true. I think it's probably true that... Uh, most Americans put this very, very low on the list of real problems. So the power elite has had a big problem pushing this down our throats because this is what I found, even at Stan State, California State University, where I taught, my students come there without a tremendous academic background, but they come smart and they come with common sense. And, and the more, you know, they're connected to farmers and people who hike and get outside and look right. at nature, the more they realize that this is silly, you know, that nature has, uh, you know, vagaries, uh, seasons, uh, gets warmer this year, gets colder next year. Um, it, the whole thing is, it's a real hard sell now. So that's why they have the Pope and the Dalai Lama. Right. <laughs> and now that last week, or the week before, Putin comes out and says it's a fraud. Yes. Man-made climate change is a fraud. I, I danced around the living room for 20 minutes after after he came out with that statement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's great. Putin, of course, was with the KGB, wow. and he's he's no dummy. Right. And uh, you know, he's a lot of people that you know know, and I think China also. Uh, there's there's several countries that are not uh -huh. on board. See, they they really need to get the whole world on board if they're going to change. Uh, the UN is going to implement Agenda 21. Going back to me, Marie Strong, he also is the author of the Agenda for the 21st Century, Agenda 21, <clears throat> which gives more power, of course, to the United Nations and lets them regulate our energy so that the global warming then becomes the center case of an entire environmental package with an Earth Charter right. and the Ark of Hope. And this is going to be the new religion. Gorbachev and Marie Strong, you know, wrote this Earth Charter and did this big hoop to do with the, the uh -huh. Ark of Hope. And uh, so they, they really want to kill Christianity. That's what they've always wanted yeah, to do. Yeah, it's a major thing. Major thing. And of course, I was there in the Central Valley in, in uh, California. A lot of my students were Christian. And uh, they helped me see the world a little bit differently. At the time, I was not. I was kind of a nature guy and then a Buddhist right. and now I'm a Christian because I see their Christians you know like Tex Mars are very intelligent Christians really understand what's going on and have the background to stand up to it and that's what I've seen with the with the global warming fraud um, not that many people are willing to stand up against it some 
smart Christians are. So, you know, that's that doesn't prove Christianity, but it right. it does prove that there is a group of people there with some backbone and some right. intelligence, you know. I can remember so, from your the, the the end of your interview uh with Hendrick, you said I the question came up about religion. And you said I don't have one, but I'm leaning toward Christianity. And I think a lot of us are doing that because they seem to be languaged for the situation, whereas the rest of the population was stripped a lot of the language that they need to deal with what's coming up. Do you agree with me on that? I think you do. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah Tex Mars has a program called Power of Prophecy. And uh, he is an interesting character, 22 years uh, in, the, in the Air Force as an officer. Uh, but he also is a Bible-believing Christian, right. and he has always had an interest in geopolitics. So ever since the young age, in the young age of 12, he's been reading about politics and trying to put it together with Bible prophecy. And he puts the two together in a way that really makes sense, as, as well as, as some others. Now, a lot of people don't. <laughs> right. And the book of Revelation sure can get pretty wild and crazy, you know. Right. But... Uh, but yeah, people like Tex Mars do manage to, uh, for instance, you know, I might say to some one of my colleagues back in California, who's a good friend, for instance, uh, uh, you know, global warming is a hoax. And he said, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. Right. Well, of course, anybody who looks at it knows that the world works. It's, it's, it's driven by people who make conspiracies. They're criminals. Right. And so, you know, and uh, and mostly they're Jews, you know. So so if I say Jews made a conspiracy, then, of course, I'm an anti-Semitic right. uh, conspiracy theorist, you know. And, of course, then they neutralize you by, by calling you something, right. and they diffuse and deflect the issue. Well, if you understand the Bible, which Tex Mars and those guys do, you understand about conspiracy theories because it's it's all laid out that this gigantic conspiracy theory is going to occur in the end times. Right. And uh, so, like you say, they have the language, they have the concepts that allow them to see what's going down. <laughs> right. <laughs> Most of us don't, you know. Right. So, that... yes, I would say I'm a Christian. Yeah. But that... I have a hard time finding, you know, a congregation that I connect with. I certainly believe in the Earth science, uh, you know, four and a half billion year right. uh, Earth. I'm a scientist. But I also believe uh, the basics of Christianity. Right. But you can't turn, I, I've done this myself, you can't turn them over to an organized religion or a church because right. they're full of deceptions. So you have to kind of believe in yourself and kind of trust what you're feeling. It's a real uh, conundrum. It's a real conundrum. This, this, yes, it is. This, I, one of the people that Tex Mars interviews is a guy named Edward Hendry, who is an author, a Christian lawyer, works with the U.S. State Department. He wrote a book called Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Of course, that's the book of Revelations. Tracking the beast from the synagogue to the Vatican. Okay, for years I was a Catholic, or I went to Catholic uh -huh. church. Okay. But now I see that the Pope, according to Edward Henry and guys like that, very much in on the whole conspiracy, uh -huh. and that uh, he... This fits in with what the Pope is saying about the global warming. I mean, this is nonsense. Uh, this guy would say the Pope's the Antichrist. <laughs> well, I don't know who the Antichrist is. Right. But, uh, but um, anyway, I don't go to Catholic Church anymore because I realize, as Henry points out, it was a crypto-Jewish organization from its very inception. Right. right. And many Popes have been Jewish. And so what we have been is in the end times, if that's what we're in, Judaism reclaiming and infiltrating all of the religions, including Buddhism here in Crestone, and all the New Age movement is Jewish. It's also Nazi, by the way. There's a huge overlap between the two. And theosophy and all that stuff. I mean, this is all this Babylonian, Egyptian uh, nature worship, paganism, worship of the serpent. And this is where... Uh, you know, Isis and Osiris and Horus and all this Egyptian stuff, the the star Sirius, which is Satan, and it's all this satanic stuff. Right. Is everywhere you turn, people are worshiping Satan with a different name, you know. And uh, so this is rather discouraging, you know. Who wants to worship Satan? I mean, Satan is a loser, and he's uh, right. 
a monster and uh, he hates everybody and uh, his destination is the pit of hell forever and uh, apparently he wants a lot of company and a lot yeah of fair, apparently he does <laughs> i i've noticed that a lot of the new age movement was designed to take away the language that we had to deal with the situation we're in in other words the concept of satan a lot of those concepts were washed away by the New Age. Uh, so it's disarmed us. I think that's a very good point. Um, if you don't mind, I'll digress a little bit on that. Please. Um, I live in Crestone, Colorado, and uh, it's a very interesting story. <clears throat> Let me give you my four websites. I, I've, I've told you naturalclimatechange.us. The one that I started with is 911nwo.com, and that's the one I've been working on the most. And it's that website that has the most on the quote-unquote New World Religion, yeah. which is, of course, the New Age movement, uh, Mystery Babylon, religion, Satanism, all that stuff. Well, that's uh, then I also have a, a website called um, waterwatchalliance.us. I did that one on a sabbatical in 2008, and I'll get around to that in a second. And then I have my musical website. I've got about 22 CDs. That's what kind of keeps me happy and sane amidst all this uh, heavy stuff. <laughs> uh, EricCarlstrom.com, my name is, I play banjo and guitar and piano, and I write music. And, uh, of course, nobody buys CDs anymore, but I still make them. And as the joke, uh, bluegrass joke goes, all my CDs are million sellers because I've got a million in myself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, okay, going back to uh, living here in Crestone, Colorado. Um, Marie Strong, who made a billion dollars in Canada as head of Hydro Canada, Petro Canada, Dome Petroleum. He was a protege of the Rockefellers from the get-go right. with the United Nations, never graduated from high school, but was connected with the Rockefeller family, and, but also got, uh, he has a bio that must be about, uh, you know, 50 pages long, all the boards of directors that he was on, director of this, director of that. So he made his billions in gas, oil, and water. This is the guy who's Mr. White Hat Environmentalist Saving the Earth on my Race to Save the Planet series. Right. Well, in 1985 or 4, somewhere around there, he was asked, apparently, to come down and be on the board of directors of the Arizona Land and Cattle Association, which owned a, an old Baca land grant, Spanish land grant, in the San Luis Valley here, where I live, 12 miles on a side, and this was a gigantic consortium. Now, for your readers to read up on this, I would really suggest that they look at a book called uh, Cloak of Green by Elaine Duar. Let's see if I can find that book. Yes, just a second. Elaine Duar was a journalist out of uh, Canada, uh, and about the time the Earth Rio Earth Summit uh, was getting going, the 1992 Rio Earth Summit that Marie Strong organized, um, she was looking into the environmental movement, wrote this book, Cloak of Green, and the subtitle is The Links Betwe Between Key Environmental Groups, Government, and Big Business. Okay, one-fifth of this book is about Marie Strong. <laughs> and about 15 pages in a row talks about all his incredibly complex business dealings all around the world. And the guy is a mover and shaker and operator of, of the highest magnitude. Um, well, he was brought onto the board of directors here of the Arizona Land and Cattle Company, which owned, you know, stockyards over there and banks over there and, and uh, you know, many, many, many different businesses 
And apparently they had a, there was a, in the background some schemes of controlling food and water in North America. <clears throat> the, the Grand Canal uh, plan to bring water from Canada down through the Midwest and, you know, kind of, and this, this was going to be a focal point. Well, what he did was he got on the board, ostensibly he said he was brought down to uh, solve a problem that they had, which was Adnan Khashoggi who was a gun drug uh, dealer from the Middle East uh, back during the Iran-Contra, was on the board. He's a billionaire from Saudi Arabia uh, with a very uh, kind of a, a tainted past. And so Marie Strong says he was brought down to, uh, to relieve them of this uh, PR problem. Well, he wound up, of course, owning the entire Baca Ranch uh, as Arizona land and cattle was, you know, morphed and sold off, then he owned it, became uh, his. He set up a number of corporations. One was American Water Development Incorporated, AWDI. Oh, another part of the story, we may have one of the largest freshwater aquifers in North America, right here in the San Luis Valley. And, of course, Marie Strong then... Uh, made a plan with his AWDI to pump the water, because now he owned the surface, uh, pump the water over to Denver and make another billion for himself as a Canadian. Right. And, uh, and he also was very, at this point, very, very highly connected at the UN and had lots of very powerful backers, including David Rockefeller and right. Edmund de Rothschild. Now we're talking the global elite. Right. Murray Strong supposedly, according to... Uh, uh, one ex-British uh, uh, MI6 officer, Dr. John Coleman, a member of the Committee of 300 that yes. runs the world. You know, we're talking right there at the top of the pyramid. And uh, in 1987, there was the fourth International Wilderness Conference held in Denver. Uh, Marie, Marie Strong was there uh, introducing Edmund de Rothschild, the most powerful man in the world, perhaps economically, king of right. the Jews. Uh, David Rockefeller was there along with all kinds of bigwigs um, of the Aspen Institute, which also had a presence here in Crestone, Colorado. And these guys were going to plan a boundaryless new world order. No more states. Uh, and uh, we're going to now all survive kind of with a whimper with a kind of a hive mind, lostness of consciousness, kind of a Buddhistic uh, uh, zoned out Aldous Huxley kind of uh, thing where we're all going to enjoy right. our servitude, you know, and we're going to be in bliss, but we're going to be slaves. Right. And this is basically what they're saying, you know, in this 1987. And they, they define the fourth world as, as, you know, now we've replaced the first, second, and third world of the old days, third world being right. the poor countries, first world being the free, and the second world being the, the communist. It's all going to be a boundaryless uh, um, one world government, guess what, you know, with these, right. ass, uh, these people at the top. Right. And uh, this was back in 87. Now, there was a Christian by the name of George W. Hunt who was invited to some of these meetings, and uh, he was a businessman. Well, he blew the whistle on the whole thing, and, and he developed a website, and he wrote extensively about it, and you can look him up on the internet, and, and he's given talks about it. He, he passed away a couple of years ago, but not before I think he really kind of, you know, exposed the whole thing, and just how elitist and draconian the whole thing was. But anyway, so that's the background for the San Luis Valley here, the power elite, uh, Marie Strong wearing a developer hat, his black hat, billionaire hat, and his white hat, his environmental champion hat. Same guy. Right. You know, these guys are playing all sides. And uh, at, at the conference, David Rockefeller was playing Mr. Development, and William Ruckelshaus, the head of the EPA, was playing Mr. Environment. And it's all, you know, Hegelian dialectic, right. uh, you know, controlled conflict through management of opposite uh, viewpoints. Absolutely. It's, so anyway, in 1988 or thereabouts, uh, Marie Strong was defeated by a coalition of environmentalists and ranchers, supposedly, in the, in the San Luis Valley. And he sold his interest in the Baca Ranch. 
Um, in other words, AWDI did not pump the water to Denver. It's still sitting there. Uh, but that's a whole other story because the state laws have gradually morphed so that the locals with the water rights uh, mostly can't afford to own their water rights anymore. So right. something's going to happen soon. But anyway, yeah, and there is another bid now by another group to take that water for Denver, where probably it, it will go. It probably should go. But uh, he took a million dollars of his profits from the sale of the ranch. This is a guy who never bought a share in the whole eight right. the Arizona land of cattle. But he comes in and he, you know, rakes off millions in profits. And he takes a million dollars and he funds and establishes the Manitou Foundation. Now, the Manitou Foundation was run by his wife. And Manitou is a, a Algonquin Indian word meaning something about spirit wind. Well, then they, then they see, he owned the whole ranch right up to the top of Kid Carson Peak, uh -huh. you know, right up to one of our 14ers. So owning the water rights and everything, owning the rain that falls. And uh, so he, uh, what they did before he left or sold the ranch, they took a, a beautiful strip of land right at the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and uh, developed a plan by which the Manitou Foundation would grant land parcels to spiritual groups from all over the world. So this started happening about the middle 80s. The Carmelite Catholics were invited from Sedona and then this Buddhist group and that Buddhist group and this Hindu group and that Sufi group and this Japanese Shumei group. And now we have, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 different spiritual groups. We are the United Nations of, we are the world of, uh, of all world religions. And you can bet your bottom dollar there's plenty of witchcraft here too, behind it all. Um, but anyway, so at the surface it all looks wonderful. There's lots of, you know, it's a beautiful place for retreats. So Buddhists will come and do a you know month retreat or a week retreat, and Catholics will come and do a week retreat at the Hermitage of the Spiritual Life Institute, the Carmelites. And uh, so this then became kind of uh, the strong presence. It was it was under the under the aegis of his wife Hannah, who's from Denmark. It was actually his second wife, who was his interior decorator, <laughs> and right. then. An attractive woman with, with you know blonde hair and, and very much a spiritualist. So she, uh, there is a movie about this now, by the way, called The Flame, Finding Gold in Crestone, Colorado. And if you're interested in looking at this 90-minute movie, which was made a couple years ago, it, it interviews a number of the spiritual leaders, and it shows Hannah Strong saying, uh, you know, if you don't do the work here, you better hit the road. So here's this lady from Denmark telling people they have to do the work, whatever that is, whatever spiritual work, or else leave. Well, it has been like that. We have now become kind of a company town. This is our identity. We're not allowed to be anything else, I think. You know, I right. think there's town mothers and fathers who behind the scenes manipulate us, uh, probably the CIA, right. um, as well as other intelligence groups, because these religions make excellent fronts for people coming in and out all the time here uh, from all over the world. And so we have a very international community. We have all these spiritual groups. And, of course, this is the New Age Mecca. Right. Um, and, uh, okay, so that gets into the New Age. Well, then, this was all set up in the late 80s. And then in 1992, Rio, the Rio Earth Summit occurred in Rio de Janeiro. Marie Strong presiding over a whole new political agenda for the world, which is the Environmental Agenda 21 agenda. Meanwhile, Hannah is there, and she's ahead of a couple conferences on spirituality. And 5,000 NGOs are invited to Rio. And so you have the Dalai Lama, and you have Sting, and you have John Denver, and you have all these cool people, you know, giving a kind of a religious push you know, a new age push to this new world order of Agenda 21, where the United Nations is going to be the prototypical world government, and we've got a new world religion to go with the new world order. So Crestone fed right into that and has been doing that ever since, even though it's 23 years past. That's who we are. 
We are to be the prototypical interfaith, merge all the religions into one. Right. And, of course, that's going to be ruled by the elite. And uh, right. so maybe you, the interview you heard uh, at uh, with Henrik at, at the Red Eye Center, you had to do with this, the New World Religion, the New Age, New World Religion, which this is trying to be. Right. You're, you're kind of poised uniquely between the climate fraud and the New Age fraud. And you can see how they, 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 they work together. And I'm sure you're doing the work out there, aren't you? You're doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you, Paul, I was a Buddhist for 15 years. Uh -huh. And uh, I was a serious meditator. And then I was a Catholic for about 15 years. And, you know, I've got lots of books on both subjects. So I certainly did the work. Uh -huh. But now, you know, I realize that these Buddhists are just basically sitting around waiting to die so uh -huh. they could get enlightened at the moment of death. And that didn't look like a very good alternative to me after a while. And I saw a lot of the balding boulder Buddhists coming down uh, here. Balding you know, boulder. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and you would know some of them. Perhaps. Coming and, down uh, from Boulder, yeah. We know Boulder. Yeah. A lot, there's a pipeline between here and Boulder. And uh, so Buddhists Buddhist were kind of the dominant religion here for a while. But, you know, um, after 15 years, I realized that these Westerners did not seem to me to be very sweet, kind, warm. Yeah. They seemed to be pretty sharp and critical. And uh, so I... Well, I don't want to hang out with those people. You know? Right, right. And I don't want to just keep sitting on my butt and, and emptying my mind, you know, uh, when there is other work to do, for instance, like trying to preserve our Bill of Rights, our right. country, um, being a citizen in America, uh, you know, kind of being who you were. I mean, I, ha I was born with a name, and I have a history. The Buddhists want to take that away from you. Yeah. They want to have a new name. And lose your ego. Well, uh, guess what? That's the basis of British psychiatry for all those right. years. So the Buddhists are helping the British psychiatrists turn Americans into non-citizens, right. non-entities, people who are concerned more about the taste of their latte than they are about losing the water in the San Luis Valley. Right. So that's, I, that's what I. That's what I. The work that I've done <laughs> it has shown me. I think perhaps the, the the best religion, and it has shown me what is it important what what is important to do with the life that we have. Right, and what you're doing today, right now, I think is absolutely critical. Getting this word out, and you're speaking from some. You're a geologist, for heaven's sakes. If anybody, physical <laughs> geographer, physical, physical geography. I mean, you would know about climate change before anybody else did. And then how they roped you into teaching a human ecology. I mean, that is all about, uh, what do they call it? Double speak, human ecology. It's as if we're just part of the ecology. You know, we're just another bird species or a plant that could be wiped out or is interfering with the processes of the planet. It's a strange, strange dynamic they set up. You're absolutely correct. The, 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 <laughs> The underlying text there is that we are just one of many species and that we're no better than any other. And that, you know, I was, as you said, you were fooled by so many of these new age movements. Everyone. I was very much an environment. Let's face it, there is a difference between humans and grizzly bears and elk. Yes, we want grizzly bears and elk in our world, but it's not uh, a situation of equality or parity. Humans, I, again, going back to Christianity, made in the image of God, we have the ability to, we have spiritual uh, a soul, which is, I think, immortal. I don't know about the bears and the elk. I, I'm not going to weigh in on that, but uh, I think humans are very special. Um, and uh, this, it gets into a very misanthropic uh, worldview, which, as a professor, I... I, I got into for a while. It's not a very happy place to be. Oh, right. we have to kill off 90% of humanity because they're destroying the Mother Earth goddess. Well, right. there is no Mother Earth goddess. What we right. have is a planet. 
Right. <laughs> which, <laughs> well, you know, with, which has got a crust and then, a, you know, a mantle and a core and a bunch of vegetation and soils and, and a biosphere at the surface. But it's not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a Greek mother earth goddess in my book, you know. Right. But that's part of the New Age thinking, of course. It's, uh, it's a sentient. It's, 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 right. And the earth is going to, the earth is mad because humans have, you know, right. transgressed against. So what we've done is we've taken the whole Genesis story of original sin and transposed it into the environmental movement, you know, where nature was perfect without humans. Humans came along, we transgressed, we sinned against nature. And now Gaia, the Mother Earth goddess, is going to have to punish us by, you know, radically reducing our numbers. Well, it turns out that's the eugenics goal of the yeah, Absolutely. From the robber baron days over a hundred years ago, you know, so they're very clever about pulling in these different, you know, ideas. Right. Uh, I remember uh, hearing something by, uh, what was the name, uh, Tarpley. Uh, Webster Tarpley. Webster Tarpley. And he was, he's a historian. And he was talking about how it was either the Greek or the Roman Empire. The elites during that were worried about overpopulation. And they were major programs to reduce the population back then. So you know it's just what they do. It's just what they do. And this yes. is a really clever way of getting it because they've got, the, they've got this climate change hoax and they've totally disarmed us with the New Age uh, religions coming up. And uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's an incredibly... Uh, thoughtful and well put together piece of propaganda but as people are waking up it's they're not getting very far well they're getting far but it's not happened yet you know right i think they've they're behind on their timetable yeah you know, they're always trying to move us towards this one world government new world order new world religion which by the way will be capital the capital will be jerusalem and uh, if you listen to Tex Mars, as I do, you know, uh, what they want to do is build this kind of universal temple on the Temple Mount. Of course, they got to get rid of the Dome of the Rock first, which is right. the, uh, the Muslim uh, mosque. Uh, and, and Tex has a very interesting lecture on Operation Jericho, which could be a, a man-made earthquake to do just that coming from our heart. <laughs> facilities and that's one of the plans that the military our military has and he knows that for a fact because of his context but uh so the plan is to put this universal church probably the pope this crypto jewish guy jesuit head of the jesuits jesuit. he is the black pope uh he will be the figurehead for the new world religion the quote perhaps the antichrist whatever um maybe maybe not but but this each of the Religions then will get a little kind of a satellite uh, uh, complex uh, cathedral uh, worship center coming out from the center of, uh, of this uh, kind of Catholic thing, I guess. It, you know, and again, I think Crestone is, it has always been, you know, trying to kind of move in that direction towards right. that interfaith uh, reality. We have conferences here about interfaith. You know, the Buddhists and the Catholics are just going to shake hands and, you know, come up with something that everybody can agree with. Well, I was 15 years a Buddhist. I was 15 years a Catholic or aspiring to be. Uh -huh. And I can tell you that these systems are not compatible. So to, to right. keep both of them in your mind at the same time, which some here to try to do, you have to have a double mind. Uh -huh. You have to be double minded. You have to, like Orwell says, you have to have to double think. You have to believe opposites that don't possibly uh, uh, support each other. Right. Okay, that's what they want. According to Tex Mars, that is the basis of the New World religion, which is Satanism, is the double mind. You know, and of course, James in the New Testament says the double minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we are being. We're being fed a false reality with, with global warming because that's not what, but they don't, they, they hate God. Bottom line, they right. want to recreate 
reality, tukun olam, the reinvention or the repairing of the world. This is the Hebrew, the Jewish. Um, they're going to have this Jewish utopia. That's the goal, which, of course, they're going to run because they are God's chosen people in their mind. They're the only right. real human beings. The rest of us are all just cattle, goyim, goyim. you know, to be slaughtered or to be slaves. Um, they're going to rule from Jerusalem. This is the plan. The Freemasons are totally on board with this because that's a totally crypto-Jewish organization which is based on the Jewish Kabbalah, mm -hmm. which is the system of black magic, which permeates all of the New Age. Right. So if you, if you look at the, the, core, the, uh, the similarities between, say, Nazism and the New Age movement, well, Hitler was a New Age guy. The Tool Society, Absolutely. the Vril Society, he believed very much along the lines of Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy, the Theosophical System. Yeah. Helen Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley, these major figures in sorcery, also top spies. So we have the kind of the marriage of intelligence, quote unquote, and black magic, that they can define reality now. They can, if, if they say the climate's warming, it's warming. And they're just going to repeat it, even though it's cooling. <laughs> Right. To believe it's warming. And of course, then we get our minds become double minded. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's warming. You know, yeah, it's, we had a real cold winter, you know, here and here and here, but it's warming, you know. So uh, I think Texas helped me understand the dynamics of the of the elite and their. Um, well, it, there's a great book by uh, Douglas Reed at the end of World War Two wrote the book called The Controversy of Zion. And he said, Judaism is a political program disguised as religion. Right. Yeah, the political program is to take over the world, and it has been for thousands of years. Right. Um, but it's a little more complex than that because it masquerades as the Old Testament religion. It's not the Old Testament religion, according to texts. It's actually Mystery Babylon the Great. It is actually paganism, worship of the serpent. It is the religion of the Jewish Kabbalah, which is a system of black magic, and the Babylonian Talmud, which is the rabbi's commentary, which says the best of the Gentiles kill, and it's okay to have sex with a three-year-old girl. Right. These guys are pedophiles. These guys are homosexual pedophiles. Absolutely. At the highest level, the mega council of 10 billionaires that runs this country in New York City, these guys are Jewish, billionaire, pedophile, homosexuals. And uh, I say, let them have their own continent, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> on some other world. world. Let them rule the penguins. That's right, on some other world. Hey, I'm going to throw in a curve on you here. What about the, uh, we have another religion that I think is also satanic. It's making a big uh, play for this thing. It is, and uh, actually po the Pope's new religion is beginning. Some people think it's going to be called Chrislam because we have this whole Islamic movement who, who is the worship their savior is a pedophile. I mean, he married his, his wife at six, didn't consummate it till she was nine, but, but fooled around with her before then. Uh, it, it, uh, its tenets and the, the, uh, Koran is real similar to me to the Talmud. I mean, with the draconian type punishments, the stoning of women for being raped. Uh, have you thought about the, how that's affecting this whole dynamic? I'm sure you have. Yeah, well, of course, what, it, what is it? 1.2 or 1.4 billion, billion people would, would claim uh, Islam. And it's kind of a double-edged sword, as you might expect, because these people are not on board with the New World Order. They're extremely suspicious of the Jews. They, they would have probably known, you know, the afternoon of September 11, 2001, who was really behind it, right. i.e. Israel. And now we have a lot of people who are, you know, including Alan Sobrowski of the U.S. Army War College, who is a Jew, who says he's 100% sure Israel did 911. Well, that's the conclusion I came to a long time ago in my 911nwo.com right. website. Well, okay, so Jews are going for the whole enchilada. The Muslims, 1.4 billion, 
Uh, text would say that it, it is a religion based on Satanism. I, I am not an expert on that for sure, but um, I, I do know that if you look at Huntington's, you know, Clash of Civilizations, the, the elite plan of, you know, Washington and the think tanks, uh, the CFR, which is 80% Jewish, the Council on Foreign Relations, would be to have the Christians and the Muslims kill each other off yeah. in a clash of civilizations, which is what's supposed to be happening now in all these wars in the Middle East. Right. The United States is prosecuting all these wars for Israel on behalf of Israel. So Israel can become what they call Eretz Israel, Greater Israel. If you look at the flag you know, of the, of the state of Israel, which was formed in 1948, it's got a blue stripe at the top and a blue stripe at the bottom. And uh, right at the very beginning, David Ben-Gurion and others said, well, the, the stripes represent the, the Nile and the Tigris River, or maybe it's the Euphrates. Uh, I think it's the Euphrates. But anyway, they, they want greater Israel. They want it all in, in the Middle East. That's why Hitler was designed to push those comfortable Jews out of Europe, down into Palestine, and this is, the Jews were working with Hitler. They funded and, and backed him. The American capitalists under Alan Dulles, the Sullivan and Cromwell legal agencies, and this is what I've been working on, Paul, on my 911nwo.com website, oh, yeah. is, is how Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster, who were really the heirs apparent of Colonel Edward House, who was the, you know, agent tour, Illuminati agent tour, who who, and, and Bernard Baruch, these two Jews, who managed Wilson, President Wilson, got us into World War I, got us the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Act and the income tax of 1913. Um, these, uh, the, the Dulles brothers then pick up the ball, founded the CFR in 1922, were at the Versailles Treaty, uh, setting the peace terms after World War I that ensured World War II, they were doing the deals with Hitler in the mid 30s, right? Guaranteeing that Hitler would pay back all the loans he was getting from Wall Street. 70% of the investments from Wall Street in the 30s, when we had a depression, were in Germany so oh, they could geez. build their war machine. Okay, so, and then in 1935, these same fascists who run this country came up to Brigadier General Smedley Darlington Butler most decorated Marine of all time, and asked him to lead 500,000 soldiers, because he'd been a World War I hero, on Washington to take over Washington for the fascists. Smedley Darlington Butler said, okay, I'll meet with you, let's talk. So they talk, and he gets the names, he gets the plan, and then he goes to Congress and says, look, at these guys want me to take over the country, and he reports them. Right. He saved America from being taken over by these fascist pigs in 1935. Of course, the press vilified him terribly. But one man saved America at that point from the fascists. So, you know, the top guys are fascists. They want this pyramid corporate structure. Well, in 1930, 25, the top six chemical companies in Germany merged under IG Farben. IG, you know, all these different, you know, Bayer and Hecht and all these uh, Agra, whatnot, becoming the most powerful chemical consortium in the world, all over the world. This became the foreign capital base that allowed the Nazis to come to power. And some say IG Farben is Hitler. Hitler is IG Farben. Actually, IG yeah. Farben is before Hitler. They just picked this clown off the street in right. Vienna with another guy without a high school diploma. Another guy who was Satanized, completely possessed, even yeah. according to C.G. Jung, the psychologist. And, of course, he became the demigod. But uh, Nazism then um, became the Hegelian fascist opponent then of not only communism in Russia, but the, the social um, socialism uh, under FDR in America. So now we got three kinds of social. who scared the Jews to migrate with the transfer agreement that they made to, to migrate to Palestine so that they could eventually take over the Middle East. You see, this is the plan. And then after World War II, 
uh, well, Dulles was all over Switzerland during World War II making deals, you know, with his Stromwell and Sullivan, uh, uh, top lawyers uh, for the robber barons in America. And then after World War II, when the OSS and the CIA are formed, Dulles helps set up Operation Paperclip. Sorry, that's my noisy Akita. Yeah. Um, Operation Paperclip uh, was, was set up so that thousands of the top Nazis, and we're talking rocket scientists, mind control scientists like Joseph Mengele, and spies like Richard Galen, came through the rat lines, through the Vatican, into North and South America. And so the Nazi International was set up in South America, including Ecuador, where yeah. you are, yeah. and in Brazil and Paraguay uh, and Argentina. Argentina, especially. mostly. Yeah. yeah. And then all of these top, of course, our NASA, our space program, was, was based on, was run by Werner von Braun and the Nazi uh, rocket scientist. So the Nazis have had an enormous uh, role in post-World War II America and actually probably have been the dominant power in terms of the CIA, right. drug running, uh, terrorism. Now, going back to your question about the Islamic uh, terrorists, the, a lot of this is being coordinated by the German uh, Nazi International, which never surrendered, by the way. And this, of course, Joseph Farrell has written many books about this. Right. And he's got lots of good interviews. So anyway, it's, it's, this is what I've been looking at lately is, is the degree of, I've written a corrected history. It's on my 911nwo.com website. Corrected history of, of uh, the last 100, 200 years, which starts out with, you know, the city of London, the Jew money power, the Jew money kings out of London uh, taking down America uh, in the 1800s. And this is written by a Christian uh, minister by the name of Woolfolk, L.B. Woolfolk, the Great Red Dragon, or London Money Power. And this is a, a book that he, uh, he, he, again, he uses scripture and, and says the Great Red Dragon is the serpent, and he identifies it with the, the city of London. But he's, he also uses biblical prophecy, and he says, well, it's Germany that's really going to take down America. And I think you can make the case that Germany with the Nazi International, by infiltration and right. by behind-the-scenes manipulation, has done a lot to destroy America. And then I've reviewed also uh, things by a great author by the name of Christopher Story out of England. And he's written a book, if I can just pull it out here. It, it's hard to get this book. It's $100 off the Internet. It's called uh, The New Underworld Order, Triumph of Criminalism. Uh, dark. dark Actors Playing Games, The Global Fantasies of the Geomasonic Illuminati. This guy is a one-man intelligence agency out of Britain. He's an economic journalist. He died, I think, probably was poisoned. Right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he's a Christian. Uh, in his, I think he died in 2010. This book is 2006, and it gives you the inside story on a lot of these things. So what I did is I, I've cut and pasted accounts from about eight authors to get a corrected history of, of our times, including the importance of Zionism, Nazism, Zio-Nazis. Right. Um, and uh, it is so radically different from what we are taught that uh, I hope people read it. Um, I hope they do. You know that the, uh, <clears throat> the Rockefellers paid $139,000 at the end of World War, uh, World War II to write the definitive history of World War II. So everything that we're told, everything that we were taught in school, is their version, their fiction of history. See, they're changing the past as we go. That's why things like your rewriting and redoing that needs to get out. People really need to look at that website and, 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 do, and take advantage of your work in revising. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, it is. It, I just realized now where your camera is. Now I'm looking at, I think, at your camera there. Before I've got two computers here, a big one and a little one. Well, this is your this is your maiden voyage. I mean, this, this is, is my good. maiden voyage. Yeah. yeah. But now I know where your camera is. It's in my big Thunderbolt Mac uh, unit here. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, very important. Uh, and you know, my education in a lot of ways, Paul, started when I retired from being a professor in 2011. Me too. Because, Me too. Yeah, Me because too. I was out of that bureaucracy and now I could pursue knowledge that is important, really unconstrained. Right. I was no longer in a little box. I was no longer, you know, just, okay, you're the physical geography professor. You get to know about this. Right. You know, the way we balkanized knowledge at our universities is, is terrible. Um, it's but anyway, so... Since 2011, I have written a, a 1,200, over 1,200 pages now. Let me point that out. To, <laughs> this is a, this is a, uh, uh, I've got volume one and volume two. Is Crestone Baca, Colorado, the Vatican City of the New World Order? Question mark. An expose of the New World Religion. All of this is on my 911nwo.com website. And I've written now quite a few more appendices that go with it. It's 1,200 pages Xeroxed, um, you know, just uh, right. I made 10 copies. <laughs> so it's not published. But all of the material is on my 911 website. And it's in some of the local libraries. Uh, so this, this uh, the, the title is Crestone Baca, the Vatican City of the New World Order comes from a speech that a conservative guy named Tom DeWeese made at the American Policy Committee in 1996 to a conservative group in which he said, Crestone Baca Maurice Strong believes is the Vatican City of the New World Order. So I took that as my launch point and said, okay, is this guy right? Yeah. And that's, that's, that became then my platform for investigating things uh, like uh, mind control and the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations yeah. and the Frankfurt School out of Germany and the Lindisfarne Foundation, which had a presence here, and the Aspen Institute, which had a presence here back in the 80s. And uh, looking into all the behind-the-scenes machinations by which the elite have been trying to push us towards this one-world government, one-world religion, and like you say, it's been going on since the Roman Empire and before. Right. It's an interesting uh, set of circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, once you uh, perk your head up and start looking around and you're not stuck in the paradigm, you were able to, uh, you know, look into stuff. Like you looked into climate change. That was critical that you did that. Well, that was easy for me. That was the easiest one because that's that's actually my area of specialty. Right. And I, I totally knew that that humans had very, very negligible impact on this larger system, except, Paul, geoengineering. Now, see, that's global warming is the cover story for geoengineering. Right. And now we're talking chemtrails and now we're talking harp and now yeah. we're talking militarization of 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 the weather, right. which the, the Air Force has documents saying they want to use the weather as a weapon. And uh, they've been working on this now for a long time. Absolutely. And so the global warming is, you know, of course climate changes. But humans may have some impact. For instance, in the 70s, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union made an agreement to try to warm up the poles because they wanted to find more oil and they uh -huh. wanted to be able to sail around at the high latitudes. And so they uh, uh, were using HARP and the woodpecker uh, uh, yeah. signal of, of the Soviet Union um, in an experimental way back in the 70s. Now, this is not well known, but yes, humans can have a local impact, but it's not driving cars, it's right. not burning fossil fuels, it's, it's the military and it's the on the part of the military, and right. it's all these uh, um, very, very high-tech things that most people don't even know about. Right, and climate change, the way they have it, is just paying carbon tax. 
it doesn't address fracking it doesn't address the damage from Fukushima it doesn't address and I think probably one of the worst things about the climate change hoax is that it takes total focus out of off of ecology and things that we could be doing you know using less plastics or you know it's it's really uh, satanic it's the only way I can put it it's yes, really I, dark I, it is. It, 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 they want to reinvent reality, and they want to make sure we believe in their version of it. Uh, they hate God. They hate nature. They hate humans. Um, satanic is the right word. I believe diabolical. Yes. Um, yeah, to get people in L.A. to be worried about, you know, polar bears. Right. And, and not worried about the pollution that's coming down in the, in the gully right next to their house uh, right. is insane especially since the polar bear population has actually been doing well. It's been increasing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? So it's a lie on top of a lie on top of a lie, you know. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, they're doing, they're doing really well in this. Yeah, they're thriving. And of course, just like every other species, when it gets warmer, they do better. So the idea that global warming is bad, um, actually global cooling is much more uh, um, harmful. You know, in terms of loss of life, uh, shorter growing seasons, et cetera. You know, and, and we've had that in the past, and we will adapt to whatever happens naturally. But what I'm worried about, of course, is, is what the military can do. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we have to punch our way out of this, this, this bunch of lies that we're fed. Right. I don't even watch the news anymore. I don't watch TV. No, I think TV. I actually, I think if TV was outlawed, we'd win. Right? Yes. Then. It's such a powerful mind control tool. And it can bring in things like a total deception, like global warming. Um, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's, it's interesting because you have, you, you know, you're right between climate change, which we know is a hoax, and the New Age movement, which is designed to take away the language, to, to put us in a such a non-judgmental, anything-goes kind of state that we don't have our morality anymore. So, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of floating around because we've adopted all these New Age, non-judgmental, every, everything's good. Everything's good. Uh, it's well. It's not good. It's not good. There's a lot of horrible things going on. There's a lot of ritual child sacrifices. Uh, there's all these movements to stop supposed global warming that are damaging people, like in Africa. They they can't have air conditioning. They don't can't have power plants because they could pollute. And it's it's just really a desecration. You're right. And there are books to that effect. I mean, I started referencing these in my human ecology class towards the end, uh, written by guys like Paul Dresden, who, who show that the people in Africa are being victimized. Because, yeah, they, they're supposed to go solar and wind. They're, they're not supposed to have a steel plant. No. They're not supposed to have anything that's going to burn fossil fuels. Well, that works out for the people who want the... Uh, all the all the mineral resources in Africa right. and don't want the Africans to have them. <laughs> That's right. Get rid of the Africans. And the, Interestingly, the, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say if, again, going back to Elaine Duar's book, Cloak of Green. If I can get the get the thing right this time. We got um, it. We got it. Yeah. And now I'm looking in the right direction. Um, Marie Strong in the 70s founded and headed up the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA. And he himself had a whole network of spies that covered the continent of Africa. And supposedly it was, you know, to regulate these environmental initiatives. Right. But, of course, there is a, there's several behind-the-scenes real objectives. And she makes the comment in here that it seems like wherever he went, you know, guns would be brought in. And, of course, the typical CIA way to you know, get people to destroy each other is to factionalize different tribal ethnic groups like the Shia and the Sunni, for instance, in Iraq, and then 
uh, get some get some differences going, arm both sides, and then set off a flashbang right. trigger, and then you have a revolution, and they kill each other off for you. Well, this has happened time and time again in in Africa. Well, this is this is all CIA and Absolutely. MI6 and Maurice Strong, guys like this. He was a British MI6 agent. Now, Maurice just recently died, and I guess we shouldn't take his name in vain, but I, I'm sorry. I, the guy did a lot of damage, and uh, uh, all I, I would really recommend this book if you can get it, Cloak of Green, or right. anybody can get it, because it will disabuse you of, of the notion that the environmental movement is to help the environment or to help poor people. It's just the opposite. Right. It has been hijacked by the Rothschilds, the elite, the... CIA, the intelligence agencies, which I believe are controlled by the elite. Well, that's what they're for. I think they're all set up to protect the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. We just have to happen to have happen to be in the way. Uh, also, I think it's important to note that the guy that uh, had the original idea for this global warming back in the Club of Rome was uh, the Rockefellers, and the Rockefellers at that time probably owned all of uh, Nikola Tesla's patents. Uh, I know that there were green uh, engines made in the 50s that the patents were bought up and taken away. So here, the p same people that are pushing this climate agenda, we've got to pay carbon tax, also have all the patents that could free us from this. Yeah, so we're that's, stuck. that's a very interesting point. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Farrell, Joseph P. Farrell, the guy who is an Oxford Joseph. graduate in patristics, but who knows a lot of physics, has written a lot of books about the secret technologies of, of the Nazis, the Bell and things like that, which, which one of the uses had to do with zero-point energy. And uh, he, he equates the, uh, the energy system very much with the banking system. And, of course, the reason that the banking system would suppress free energy is because if those Africans ever got a hold of free energy, they would do fine. You know, they, right. wouldn't need it. You know, they, they, they couldn't be manipulated like they are now. Right. You know, so that would change everything. And, uh, again, uh, Farrell is really up on top of this physics. It's very involved, and I'm still kind of coming to grips with his ideas. But another aspect of the, of the Bell technology, he says is an anti-gravity machine right. which may be used in some of these ufo-like craft uh -huh. that fool people into thinking they are ufos and maybe they're made you know in america right and uh, and then a third component would be a, a weapon which would be much 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 greater than even in you know hydrogen bomb so uh, apparently i think whether or not the nazis are behind it we can agree that the military is 60 or 70 years ahead Yes, of the domestic population and technology. And I noticed on your website you had something on Operation Bluebeam, <laughs> yeah. which would be this would be this fake alien invasion with all this, you know, holograms in the sky, right. Jesus coming back and Mary. I mean, they can do this stuff. And uh, so we need to get wise to what they can do or what they could do. Right. And, uh, that, that's how we disarm it. All we have to have is a little knowledge. Exactly. They're starting this thing. We were at, well, we started doing a podcast on this thing called the Black Knight Satellite. The Pepsi Cola, did you see this? Pepsi Cola country no. comes out and uh, they make this supposedly commercial, but it starts off by saying, this is real. This is not fiction. And they talk about the Black Knight satellite that's been circling the globe for 1,300 years and imply that it's the Anunnaki up there. And I think it's setting up for this blue beam. That's going to be a big hoax. That's going to sure. be incredible to watch. I hope I can live long enough to, to watch well, that. I think, you, I think you might. I mean, the way things are going. But, uh, yeah, um, hoaxes, you know, frauds are us kind of thing. Right. Once you start to realize the way these people operate. William Rockefeller, the father of John D. Rockefeller, who, of course, was a Rothschild agent, right. who man managed to get 90% of the monopoly on oil back by 1870 or 1880. Um, his father was a complete snake oil salesman. 
I mean, he sold little bits of petroleum and said it's going to cure cancer. Right. And he was a bigamist with lots and lots of wives. He was a complete, typical Jew. I mean, these guys are are uh, shysters. Right. They lie. They cheat. They sell you snake oil. Um, if you want to get the personality of, a, you know, of course, another example would be uh, Joseph Smith, the uh, the founder of the Mormon Church. He's a high level Mason. Right. Again, you know. Uh, God uh, gave me these golden tablets, and uh, uh, I'm supposed to have a hundred wives, and you know all this, and and these people are evidently very convincing because look at how many Mormons we have in the world now. You know? Amazing. That's a Amazing. that's a new age religion. That's a complete fraud based right. on masonry and the handshakes and this and the underwear and the, all these Masonic rituals, which are at bottom line based on the Jewish Kabbalah. Right. And uh, most Masons and most Mormons are probably nice people, but they don't know what's above them. Right. They don't. They don't know the kind of people that are controlling their system. You know? Right. And it's the same with the Jews. You know, most of them. I know yes. that we were. We were. I was looking into the Talmud, and I was shocked because I had never heard of that before. So I asked. I have a lot of people that are close to me that are Jewish. Hey, what about the Talmud? They had no idea. They had no idea what I was talking about. So there That's is a, a good point. And Edward Henry makes that point. He says the Jews themselves are cannon fodder, just like everybody else. Just like the rest or of us. Or the people at the top who are very, very, very evil Jews. Right. Or, as Jesus said, those who say they are Jews and are not Jews and are the synagogue of, of Satan. Satan. I mean, Jesus nailed them better than anybody has before or since. All you have to do is read the New Testament. And, uh, you know, he says they're vipers and hypocrites and children of hell. And uh, um, he, of course, did not mince words. And, of course, he was crucified <laughs> right. uh, by the same contingent uh, and who said that, you know, the blood of his blood will be on us and our and our and our future generations. Well, <clears throat> it would appear that that's the case, even though they've pulled that out of most of the modern churches. You can't say that in a modern church, even right. though it's in Scripture. Uh, Tex Mars will talk about that, though. Right. Yeah. And then the, the conversion of the whole Catholic Church. The Catholic Church that I think was Luciferian from the beginning. From the minute it changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, it was superseding the uh, word, word of God. But now it's really coming out. I mean, he does masses to the New World Order. And he claims that, Lu that Jesus is the son of uh, Lucifer. Lucifer is the God. You seem to be frozen up there. Here we go. Here we're coming. Yeah, you, were, you were frozen for a moment as well. I lost you at the, the, uh, uh, the Catholics uh, were demonic from the beginning. Uh, that's where I lost you. And I agree with that. Um, yeah. And now they're coming out that he is show he's openly saying that... Uh, Jesus is the son of Lucifer. That's what, uh, so. Yeah, and of course, Blavatsky and the New Age movement, the Theosophists would say Jesus is Lucifer's brother and all this stuff, you know. And the, and the Masons would say, well, there's two gods. There's Adonai, and then there's the real God, which is Lucifer. And at the 30th degree and above, they would be fully aware that they yeah. worship Lucifer uh, rather than Adonai. And then they turn everything upside down and they make the God of the Old Testament into the devil and blah, blah, blah. You know, so uh, the whole thing just gets really perverted uh -huh. in the New Age uh, doctrines. And, and what is so interesting, although you can say Jews are cannon fodder, um, Tex Mars noticed that all of the New Age religions, and there are millions of them, you know, the Church of the Boo right. back in the 60s and all these wacky things, they're founded by Jews. Um, so they have a genius at founding false religions. They, this is one of the things they do to confound right. people, is to found these New Age bogus, you know, let's worship, uh, you know, the left toe of this statue over right. here, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, it, it, one is more preposterous than the next, <laughs> and, and yet they, they see how many people they can pull in, you know. And then it gets demonic, the Process Church, and right. Charles Manson, and... These connections go all the way over to the CIA and MI6 and England and 
movies that the Rolling Stones are making, and uh, oh, it gets very complex. Well, it all comes out of, you know, well, part of it from the 1930s comes out of Tavistock. And Tavistock, yes. you know, the godfather of Tavistock is uh, Sigmund Freud and his nephew uh, Bernays. And, and what they've done is they've really created our whole environment. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting ready for Christmas here. And we're setting things up and there's Christmas carols on and stuff like that. Uh, most of that was created by the Hollywood Tavistock Jewry that created most of the mythology that we fall into, you know, uh, even as our own just American culture was created uh, by the, the uh, Tavistocks uh, for us to live in so that we'd, we would be at this stage. And there's people, freakish people, that the mind control didn't work on, like you and I, and a lot of others, that are now coming out and we're, we're screaming, wait a minute, wait a minute, watch what you're doing, look what, look how they're hurting us, look where they're getting us to. And uh, thank God for, well, I, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm, I'm currently reading this book, uh, the oh. Tavistock Institute, Social Engineering the Masses by Daniel Estelin, wonderful book. This, this man has also written a book about the Bilderbergers, and he puts it together. Um, yeah, the Tavistock Institute came out of the British uh, War Department, uh, Psychological right. War Department under uh, John Rawlings Reese, Sir John Rawlings Sir, Reese, yeah. psychologist, psychiatrist. And this was going to, you know, make New World Order slaves through mind control, trauma-based mind control of individuals and the masses. Right. Okay, that, that was 1921, right after World War I, when they studied shell-shocked soldiers, <laughs> not to heal them. Right. But to figure out how to split other people's minds so they too would become dissociative right. and shell-shocked. And how to do it to the whole public. Okay, so this is coming out of London, England the Tavistock Institute, right near the, the palace of the Queen, you know, and the city of London. And then, of course, the Germans uh, take it up with the Frankfurt School and Wilhelm uh, uh, Institute, and uh, the Russians were in it with Pavlov and those guys, and then Sigmund Freud, like you say, Kurt Lewin of the Frankfurt School Did came I... over and was head of Tavistock, and then immediately fled quote unquote to America, became a refugee bullshit right. in bullshit, America bullshit, and yeah. was, was heading, you know, this and that affiliated organization, Stanford Research Institute in America associated with Tavistock. So you have this network of many, 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 many well funded institutions dedicated to traumatizing, brainwashing the mass consciousness uh, assassination of Kennedy. Perfect. Trauma-based mind control set up by these guys. Absolutely. Uh, 911, perfect trauma-based mind control for the masses. We watch the images over and over and over again. Then we all go into a dissociative state. Right. Uh, we lose our bearings. And in comes George W. Bush saying, everything's all right. You can go out and shop again. You know? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So this is all based on what these psychologists have come up with over the last hundred years, you know. And uh, here's here's something that I've come to, Paul, which is, I think, I did an interview with Henrik, and he never aired it, and I and then they've never responded to me again on Red Ice. And I think I said some things that were a little too controversial. Uh -huh. And I think one of the things that I've come up with is. The Nazis, which is totally a cult, totally. Luciferian, uh, the, the mind control programs of Joseph Mengele were conducted in the concentration camps. That Those same quote-unquote scientists came to the United States under paperclip, Operation Paperclip by the CIA. This, these programs then became MKUltra, Bluebird, Artichoke, MK Search, MK Often, a whole series of top, top, top secret mind control programs, which is supposed to be up to 10 million Americans who are programmed with these kinds of programs who can be triggered into 
Well, a number of states. Uh, assassins, like the Manchurian candidate. Um, uh, they can be couriers with expanded um, memories. They can be sex slaves, like Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. There's a whole alpha, beta, gamma type different programs that were put into these people. Ten million of this black army. And, uh, of course, anybody who's looked at this would, would look at the shooters that we have now over in, you know, in California or right. in Colorado. These people are CIA victims. These are right. MK Ultra mind control victims. And uh, this is our CIA tax dollars at work <laughs> right. now being used to traumatize us, the American people, because these people are robots. They have yeah, no souls. Their souls have been taken. They might have a thousand or even 10,000 personalities in there, which can be triggered from one to the next. As right. you probably know, they have a core personality, which could be a preacher or a priest or a college professor or something you know, really respectable, but they can be triggered into another identity and their handlers can turn them into assassins like the Manchurian candidate. That was possible before Kennedy's assassination. And uh, the movie starring Frank Sinatra called Manchurian Candidate lays it out, 1962. Well, guess where we are now? Now we've got over 10 million of these mind-controlled slaves, right. a black army that can be triggered if Operation Blue Beam is put into effect. These people can create hell on earth here in America. You're probably smart to be in Ecuador. Right. But, <laughs> no. So, so, so my conclusion here, or my guess, this is a speculation, but it seems to line up with, with what I've discovered, is that this kind of programming was done in Illuminati families for, for thousands of years. Yep. This is what they do to their kids. Yep. Remember, you know, the, the Jews handing their child over to Moloch, yep. this, this Satan image. <clears throat> well, you know, what do they do that for? Well, then they get wealth. You know, yep. it's, it's the deal that Jesus rejected. I will give you the kingdoms of the world if you just bow down and worship me. And by the way, I want your kids. Right. You know, so they program their kids to be super this or super that, you know. Um, I think World War II is a watershed because that program was expanded to a much larger group. Hitler said right. the Third Reich is about the new man. The Third Reich is about the Superman, the Ubermensch. What is the Ubermensch? It's these mind-controlled, programmed slaves who are enhanced. And we see right. this with the Born Identity movies, things like that. It's, it's leaking out into the public with predictive programming now. We, we see that this is going on with uh, Angela Jolie being, uh, you know, the super spy uh, killer, you know. Right. And all this is coming out. But they did this back in the concentration camps of... World War II in Germany. They brought it to America right after World War II. Many Americans have been victimized unknowingly, and so many have woken up, and many have written books now about it, you know, with Kathy O'Brien and uh -huh. various people like that. So my, my uh, I think it's a breakthrough, for me anyway, and I didn't know anything about this when I was a professor, is that this Illuminati programming got refined by the German mind scientists and the American mind scientists in our academics and in our military bases and in our hospitals, and it has been applied to the masses, or at least a large segment of the masses. And this is the basis of all these shootings, yes. all these... Uh, yeah, so I think this is pretty major, uh, major stuff. I, people need to wake up to that. Realize that these poor people who are doing the shootings are not under their own control. They are exactly. completely controlled by some some others, and it's the others we need to punish and identify. Exactly. I also think. Let me throw this in to, just to, to to make it a little bit more, maybe intriguing. They do so much mind control through TV by the, the image uh, sequencing, by uh, the flicker rate being timed to your, your uh, mental rate, also the images, also using sigils, that I think that there's a major amount of the population that are mind control slaves that don't even know they are. You know, if you, sometimes you'll mention something, especially with the new age people, and they trigger a response 
and it's as if it's programmed in there. Yeah. And I, I have to think that TV, when you spend eight hours in front of the TV, which Americans do, uh, it's got to it's got to lodge things in your brain that's really that's going to help the new world order. So I th I think that's too bad. But but to end it, but to, but to but to throw a good note in here, they're doing this to stop the awakening, to stop the uh, the great God. Well, you could call it coming to Jesus. You could call it whatever. It's so powerful that these demons have had to start all this stuff a thousand years ago. And now they use all this technology to keep us from waking up. And I don't think it's working. I think we're waking up. What do you think? Well, I, I sure would like to share your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I live in Crestone, Colorado. I, I have, you know, when I taught at Stan State in California, I had a lot of respect for the intelligence of my students. Uh, they're smart, but they're not well educated because they came up through this TV, system, yeah. this propaganda system. So it's, you know, it's a battle we're in. And I think what you're doing and what I'm trying to do is, is very much on the front lines of, of, of trying to wake people up to these realities, uh, to turn off the TV, um, to realize that the military and the psychologists and the think tanks have been at war with them ever since they were conceived. Right. And that's true for you and me, even, even at our distinguished even, age. Right. Know? And, and, you know, as, as Plato said, you know, within every city, there are two cities. There's the city of the rich and the city of the poor. And it's the city of the rich that is always waging war against everybody else. Right. So that hasn't changed, but and and again, uh, um, so that's one of the reasons I felt good about being a professor to try to you know, especially in the Central Valley of California, we had a lot of minority students. I felt good about trying to get them into the middle class, into awareness, uh, to pull themselves up into a better life. Uh, I would wish that for the world, but I, I think that. Um, the Marie Strongs and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds of the world are have have enormous deep pockets. Yeah, and they've hired millions of people uh, in intelligence, in think tanks, in, uh, in politics, in Washington D.C. Right, who are doing their bidding. So uh, we can't underestimate um, what we're up against. They have the money. They have the technology. They have the media, they own the media. 96% of the world's media is owned by six Jews. Right. <laughs> you know, and Hollywood is owned, run by the Jews. You know, so yeah, we can say they're can fodder, but they act like a team because they <laughs> all figure, they all figure they're gonna benefit, you know, right. when Israel rules the world. So they might not know anything about the protocols of Zion because you're not allowed to have it in Israel. But they're, you know, they're listening to the news in Israel, and they consider Israel their first country, even yes. if they live in America. So we got seven and a half million Jews in America. They say it must be more, and that many in Israel, a couple million elsewhere. But they run the world, and because of their connectedness, because of their control of the money, uh, the elders of Zion, um, who evidently is a reality for the last two thousand plus years. Um, they run the world, and uh, we need to know that. We need to know who the enemy is, and right. that is the enemy. <laughs> exactly. And then it filters down into all the structures, you know, all the pyramidal structures, you know, with the Committee of 300 and Committee of 500 and humanism now at the bottom. Speaking of University of Chicago, I mean, you know, and uh, there's your, your neighbor, uh, Robin De Reuter, who's written a great book called 13 Illuminati Families, Paving the Road to Hell. Uh, he's a Dutch guy now living in Ecuador, more or less in seclusion. He's figured it all out, and he's got a, he's got a pyramid there. He's got a chapter that talks about humanism as the new world religion. And apparently in 1940, under the University of Chicago, Rockefeller School, uh, funded and created, uh, a, a book came out that was put in all the libraries of the world called The City of Man. 
And of course, this is supposed to replace the city of God. Yeah. Was that Aquinas or I guess, uh, or Augustine maybe, Augustine. Anyway, uh, and then, and of course it said man is the measure of all things, you know, blah, blah, blah. And no more God. And apparently within a year, all those books were recalled. So enormous resources went into getting it into all the libraries, enormous resources into recalling it. Right. Uh, but he apparently got a copy, and he basically talked about it and said what the plan was. Well, this was extant in 1940. Rockefeller, you know, laid it out, or his guy named John Maynard Hutchins, who was who was the president of, of University of Chicago, laid it out. And uh, so, that you know, we're just waking up to this. This is what we're yeah. waking up to. Who's doing it, what their strategy is, what their moves have been, and what they're doing now. All of these things that we need to know, this is a war, and we are in a war. And we haven't even talked about gang stalking, things like that, that they can do right. against the few individuals who actually stand up to them. You know, But this is what has to happen. People have to wake up, like the guy who made the Green Bomb speech in 1992, Corey Hammond, talking about mind control victims. I put that on my website. Appendix 19, the Green Bomb speech of 1992. People can read what he said about how people from all over the world have been mind controlled by this small cadre out of Nazi Germany. Joseph Mengele, Green, Dr. Green is what they called him. Right. You know, and the same structures in their heads. You know, I mean, this is what we have to learn. We have to know this stuff. That's right. I, that's exactly. That's that's your. That's our job. That's our job, Eric. And yeah, the guys with the white hair. We'll be the white hair. We're, we're, we're the, I'm, I'm sure you know about the seculum, sec, uh, the seculum and the fact that we're, a, the boomers are a prophet generation. And we're here at this time to kind of do a little bit of leadership because we're from a time of sanity. We're from a time when if someone was a member of Congress and he did something like uh, insider trading, People would be outraged. He'd be thrown out of there. And it's kind of, I think we're kind of working to kind of bridge the gap to try to, yes, there was a sane world. Here's where we've gone. And, and your wonderful writing and research is just, I think, going uh, a long distance. I, I would not have you, I would not exist. I, I love to have your website bookmarked on my computer because I love to see what you're up to and how you've parsed through uh, this very complicated subject matter. And you've, it's, it's a clear, concise, academic manner that you've done it. It's, it's really beautiful. That's why I was really anxious to have you come and talk to us with, on World Beyond Belief. And we're really uh, thankful. Before we leave, I want you to make sure that they know your name, your website, how to get uh, hooked up with your information directly, and, and maybe I can get you to come back in a little while and, and, and bring us up to date. Eric, why don't you tell them about your stuff? Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. It's, it's been very enjoyable to be able to go wide-ranging across these subjects. That's what I we do. We go wide-range. <laughs> it's very, very exciting and very important to start putting Humpty Dumpty back together. That's you know? right. But yeah, my name is uh, Eric Carlstrom. I was a geography professor for 30 years. I retired uh, in 2011. Uh, I started working on the 911 case immediately afterwards. I knew it was it was an inside job. Now I know it's an inside outside job right. by the elite. And I have a website uh, which proves that called 911nwo.com. I uh, wrote my first article about that in 2002. Uh, my my academic expertise really is in <laughs> climate change, um, <laughs> natural climate change, which is has been huge over the geologic time periods. And so my website is naturalclimatechange.us. Uh, not only do I talk about how climate change is naturally, but I also disprove the hypothesis of man-caused global warming, which is a very, very flimsy hypothesis, uh, which is easily disproven. You know, one one side has said this is you know this wouldn't rise to a, a decent science fair in an eighth grade uh, <laughs> science fair hypothesis. I mean, this is pathetic. 
<laughs> but anyway, that's that's how propaganda works. They can get you believing stupid stuff. They do. And then I have a waterwatchalliance.us uh, website, which talks about the history of the water issues right here in the San Luis Valley. And uh, to enjoy myself, I've always played music, and uh, I have a bunch of CDs and a movie on my music website, which is Eric Carl Strum, just my name, E R I C K A R L S T R O M dot com. So those four websites keep me busy. And as I said, Paul, I, my education really started when I retired from being a university professor and could pursue some of these things. Yeah, me too. Me too. When I got out of business, uh, we can sit down and you, you have time to think and you can see what's going on. So thank you very much, Eric. Uh, we really appreciate you being with us and, and maybe we can do this again. And feel free to call us if you come up with something that really needs to get out there. We're here. Oh, that's wonderful, and I sure enjoyed uh, our conversation, and I appreciate what you're doing in, uh, in Ecuador. We've gone global here, yes. and the computer is, is our link right now, and it's working. So yes. I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric.